Hey everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Got a great show for you tonight. Before we get started, make sure you say hello, don't be a stranger. Chime in, let me know where you're tuning in from. And we're going to dive in tonight and we're going to be talking all about vitamin E, the ultimate crash course on vitamin E, one of the very little discussed vitamins as it relates to nutritional health in the modern mainstream world. And so stick with me to the very end. We're going to be talking about some really important elements around this. And I can promise you, if you stay with me to the end, you'll take more away from my crash course than you'll take from most videos on YouTube about this topic. So stick with me. We're going to dive in. So let's talk about vitamin E. What exactly is vitamin E? Now it was discovered in 1922. And if we kind of look at what vitamin E is, vitamin E is a mixture of different compounds called tocopherols. So you may see this on a supplement bottle, <clears throat> which is why I'm even talking about it, but it's also uh, a family of chemicals called tocotrienols. And so there's basically, there's an alpha, beta, delta, and gamma version of these two. So think of vitamin E as not one vitamin, think of it as a family of eight different compounds kind of all together, right? And so most people, when they're talking about vitamin E, what they're really referring to is alpha tocopherol. So if you um, come across that term, you ever see that term alpha tocopherol on a supplement label, that generally is what they're referring to is vitamin E, although technically it's not the comprehensive complete form of vitamin E. So it's important to know when you're looking. So like if you're in the market and you're shopping and you're trying to find, okay, what is a good solid source of tocopherols or a vitamin E, you're gonna look for mixed tocopherols and kind of as a bare minimum, let me slide this over for just a minute. You're looking for, again, mixed, and you wanna see the alpha, the beta, the gamma, and the delta version. So if you're looking at a supplement bottle, if you don't see all four of those, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, then that's not really a comprehensive mixture for vitamin E. Now the most active form of vitamin E is the alpha. And this is why, you know, this is when we're talking about measuring vitamin E levels and doctors prescribing vitamin E. This is the one that most commonly, you know, it's the primary one that's used. But the more we learn about this family of tocopherols, tocotrienols, the more we realize that it's all important. So not just focusing on alpha. Now it's also important to understand when you're looking for a vitamin E, there's an L form, or rather a DL form, and then there's a, a D form of vitamin E. And so you want the D form, the D version. This is natural. And why does it matter? Because the synthetic version, aside from being synthetic, it's not as effective. So it doesn't work as well as the natural form of vitamin E. So you really want to make sure that when you're, again, when you're shopping, you're looking, if you're trying to supplement with vitamin E, look for the D version. Don't look for the DL version, synthetic. Look for something with mixed tocopherols. And generally it will say that. It'll say alpha tocopherol with mixed tocopherols, indicating that it has alpha, beta, gamma, and delta versions of vitamin E. Now, if you're trying to eat more in your diet, let's talk about some of the foods that really that you want to try to gravitate toward. And we're going to talk about a couple of different things around food in just a minute. But gluten, and, these are gluten and grain free foods. Obviously, you've been listening to me for any period of time. You know, I'm the author of No Grain, No Pain. And so we do things grain free around here. If that's new to you, you might want to pick up your copy. But gluten and grain free sources of vitamin E and these are listed in order of, think of this as greatest quantity to least quantity. So sunflower seeds, almonds, hazelnuts, pine nuts, Brazil nuts, tomato sauce, cranberry, apricot, avocado, fish, predominantly trout and salmon, but your fatty fish, again, this is what we're going for because it's generally where we're going to find vitamin E. Remember, vitamin E is a fat soluble vitamin. There's four of them, fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E and K, and generally where we seek to look for them and find them in our diets is through eating fattier foods. And so this applies as well. 
to vitamin E. If you look at some of the best sources, they're nuts or seeds because these tend to have more fat, right? So that's where that vitamin E is living. But also liver, eggs, spinach, and then butternut squash, asparagus, chard, bro broccoli, and blackberries, all good sources of dietary vitamin E. So there was a study done not too long ago that showed that up to 90% of people in the United States don't get adequate vitamin E in their diets on a daily basis. So again, you can do your part by just incorporating some of these healthier foods into your diet to get some vitamin E. Okay, now if we look at symptoms over here, symptoms of vitamin E deficiency, and I'm, some of these things I bring up because these are super common symptoms. Think about it like this muscle pain, muscle weakness, okay? Some of the most common reasons why people go to see a doctor are because of muscle pain, right? So this is very, very common, muscle pain and muscle weakness. Now, additionally, a difficulty walking, and this is, you know, can be construed as a loss of balance, some people refer to this as ataxia. So if you've heard your doctor mention that word to you, if you've ever been diagnosed with cerebellar ataxia, um, these are cue-ins to you to ask your doctor to test you for a vitamin E deficiency. Because if you have these things, there's a reason why. And one of the more, one, I won't say one of the most common reasons for these problems is vitamin E, but it is not a, it's not an uncommon reason. I see vitamin E deficiency on a very regular basis in my nutritional practice. And so again, uh, you wanna be aware that these are some of the symptoms of that vitamin E deficiency, muscle pain. And again, this is non-traumatic. So it's not like, you know, when I say muscle pain of non-trauma, so you didn't, non-injury, so you didn't pick up an injury. So it's not like you trained too hard or you tripped and fell. We're talking about non-traumatic muscle pain or weakness. So you didn't, you know, again, you didn't injure yourself per se and you don't quite know why that pain is there, that's a cue in to ask your doctor about testing for vitamin E deficiency. Nerve damage, neuropathy, and I mentioned ataxia up here too, but ataxia is a form of neuropathy, which is why it's listed under nerve damage or neuropathy. So again, if you've had a diagnosis of something called cerebellar ataxia, you want to talk to your doctor about vitamin E. And then visual disturbances, it's retinopathy. So somebody the other, a couple of weeks ago was asking me about nutrients and retinopathy or retinal tearing. And although we can't really say that vitamin E deficiency leads to retinal tearing, we know it leads to retinopathy, meaning damage of the retina. And so visual disturbances are sometimes the way that's manifested. And so you go to an eye doctor, get an eye checkup. He says, oh, you have a retinopathy after he looks in your eye. Next question should be, hey doc, is there a vitamin E deficiency potentially that's contributing to that? Can you test my level? So that would be the smart thing to do. And then additionally, anemia. But what are the symptoms of anemia? So what is it, what, what really is anemia? Let's kind of break that down a little bit more. The symptoms of anemia, because many people think iron deficiency, and that's not what we're referring to. There's a specific type of anemia that comes along with vitamin E. It's called hemolytic anemia. And so what happens when your red blood cells, and if we look at the shape of a red blood cell here, red blood cells are like a little disc, like a, almost like a circle that's been squished. And inside, they have that protein hemoglobin. And what happens is oxygen is carried in that little divot, in that concavity, in that red blood cell. And so what happens with the hemolytic anemia is these cells, the cell wall is damaged really easy. And so they tend to split or rupture. And so when red blood cells rupture too quickly, that's what they call hemolytic anemia. And so there's some blood tests, some basic blood tests your doctor can order to kind of define whether or not you have a hemolytic anemia. Again, it's not gonna look like an iron deficiency anemia on a blood test. So we're not looking at your hemoglobin or your hematocrit. Again, these are just markers for iron deficiency anemia or even your iron levels to try to determine whether or not you have this kind of anemia. So it's important to understand if it doesn't present on a lab test and most doctors aren't trained in nutrition to analyze you know, a hemolytic anemia as it relates to vitamin E, it's best if we understand the symptoms 
of anemia, right? So what are the symptoms of anemia? So again, if you have these symptoms, this is where you want to, again, kind of suspect this might be a possibility for you. So the symptoms would be shortness of breath. Okay. Going back to what we said earlier, muscle fatigue, more than muscle pain, although muscle fatigue can lead to muscle pain where your muscles wear out even after something really small and really easy. So maybe you walk a few stairs and your muscles are starting to get tired too quickly. Short, so shortness of breath, muscle fatigue, you feel like you can't catch your breath, even though you're, you're not exerted, but you feel exerted. Like these are some of the symptoms uh, of anemia. And then just overwhelming fatigue in general, not even just muscle fatigue, but just fatigue. You have a hard time staying awake. You're yawning a lot. You feel like you can't fill your lungs up. You've got a lot of brain fog. So these are all symptoms potentially of an anemia. And again, remember, there are different kinds of anemia. Iron deficiency anemia can cause the same symptoms as a vitamin E deficiency anemia. It's just that they look different on lab work. So again, it's, it's, if you have these symptoms, you suspect anemia, your doctor tells you that he, after measuring your iron that it's just fine, you might want to consider asking them to measure your vitamin E and making sure you don't have a hemolytic anemia. So again, these are some of the main symptoms of vitamin E deficiency. Now, I think it's important too to discuss, let's just kind of slide this over a little bit more. So the functions, because we really didn't talk about some of the functions of vitamin E, but its primary function, I know you've all heard this word before, it acts as an antioxidant. What does that mean? Antioxidants protect and preserve the structures in your body from free radical damage. So one of the reasons why a vitamin E deficiency can cause that hemolytic anemia is because it's an antioxidant in the cell membrane. What are the cell membranes made from? They're made out of fat, right? That membrane is a fat. It's called a phospholipid bilayer. It's made out of fat. What do we need to preserve fat? Fat oxidizes readily or rapidly, and so we need antioxidants to protect it. Vitamin E is known as the fat protector. It's the fat protecting antioxidant. So all of your cells, not just your red blood cells, your white blood cells, your bone cells, your muscle cells, your nerve cells, in order to maintain the integrity around, this, around the, the cell itself. So again, this is just a kind of a basic cell here. If we were to blow up and look at this under a kind of closer scrutiny, it would look something like this. Okay, this is a, called a bilayer or a phospholipid bilayer. So what this is, this is fat chains, okay? And so again, imagine this wall is, is a double structure. It's actually two walls. It's a wall on the inside and a wall on the outside with a layer in between. And so this fat in this membrane can oxidize very, very easily. And so we need antioxidants to protect it. So antioxidants like vitamin E serve as a shield okay, to prevent toxins and other free radicals from destroying or damaging the fatty membrane inside that, inside that wall, because if that happens, the cell ruptures prematurely, and then your cells are, are breaking down too quickly. They're breaking, they can break down faster than they can build. So when you have low vitamin E, it dramatically impacts your antioxidant capacity, and when that happens, membranes of your cell walls break down a lot easier. Now, vitamin E also does something. It protects not just the fat in the cell membrane, but it also protects the fat that you eat in your diet. One of the things that was really, really popular, kind of going back in time, it's become less popular today because of nutritional advocates and educators like myself, but you have that category. If you remember maybe growing up, if you're my age, butter was basically everybody was told that how unhealthy butter is and butter was kind of the, the the stepchild and it was kicked to the curb for vegetable oil now if you remember that raise your hand if you guys remember that happening and so what did we see we saw all kinds of vegetable oil particularly the margarines right um, where they would take oil like corn oil and soy oil 
and they would hydrogenate it. You know that term hydrogenation, it means they would add hydrogen to these oils to make them solid at room temperature because corn oil and soy oil at room temperature is just a liquid. It just floats around. But when you hydrogenate it, it makes it solid. So then what you get is you get margarine. And margarine, you know, that shed spread or that country crock, again, that's what I grew up, grew up, you know, we were told when I was growing up that vegetable oil was healthier than butter, but it was really corn and soy oil. Now, here's what you need to understand about that. Aside from these, not neither one of these being vegetables, corn is a grain and soy is a legume, the name vegetable oil was a marketing ploy to sell you something that isn't really all that healthy for you that you would think was healthy because they attached the word vegetable to it, just a piece of history. But these oils are what are known as PUFA oils. And PUFA stands for polyunsaturated fatty acids. And these oils are super prone to oxidation. So they're prone to damage. That's what makes it's one of the reasons why these oils are so terrible for you is they break down. And when oils like this break down in your body, it creates a chain reaction of inflammation. It's one of the reasons why these oils are so horrible for you. That's why in some, actually I think it was the state of New York that banned the sale of hydrogenated oil because of its, you know, of its risk for heart attacks and strokes. But corn and soy being poly unsaturated fatty acids, super prone to damage, what needs to happen and to, to take these oils, you, you'll notice these oils generally in the grocery store will have antioxidants added to them. So they'll add, you know, plus antioxidants plus uh, these oils because why? Because these oils would otherwise be a lot more detrimental. Well, one of those antioxidants being used is vitamin E. Again, it's a great fat protecting antioxidant. So it preserves and protects not only the fat around your cell membranes and the fat in your body, because remember the fat in your body is stored as triglycerides. That fat, when you tap into it as energy, especially if you're losing weight, you're breaking that fat down. You want plenty of antioxidant protection so that you don't get free radical damage. And why is that important? Why don't we want free radical damage? Let's slide this over a little bit more. At the end of the day, free radicals prematurely age us. So I want, the way I want you to think about this is your DNA that you're born with, it's, it's, you know, that you inherit from your mother and father. Okay, if we just kind of blow it up and look at genetically, you have these caps on the end of your DNA. They almost, if you kind of think of them almost like those little caps on the end of your shoestrings, you know, and if those caps, if those caps broke off at the end of your shoestring, the shoestring itself would start to fray out, right? Well, these caps are called telomeres and telomeres preserve the life of your DNA, if these caps shorten, so as these caps get shorter because of free radicals, that means you're aging faster. There's actually testing that can be done that measures the length of, of your telomeres to try to determine your genetic age. Uh, because if your telomeres are super short, your genetic age is accelerated. And so vitamin E, again, as an antioxidant, helps to preserve the length of those telomeres. What happens when these telomeres erode? then your DNA is more prone to damage. It's more prone to free radical oxidation. And when DNA gets damaged, the next time it replicates, well, think of it like a copy machine. Imagine you take a piece of paper. I know some of you may be too young to remember a copy machine, but maybe not all of you. Um, you take a piece of paper, right? And, you, and, and it's got some text or whatever on it and you put it in a copy. And then what you get out is a similar looking piece of paper, but on the copy, there's little imperfections. Like there's a dot here, a dark spot there, maybe a smudge there, but it's still legible. It's still readable, right? But now imagine taking this copy and making a copy of it, right? And so you make another copy, still legible, but now there's even more damage on it. And so now do this a trillion times because that's what your DNA does over your lifetime. This happens trillions and trillions of times. These copies, if you're, they're not being protected by, by antioxidants like vitamin E, 
then what happens is that damage accumulates. And so you eventually you get, just like with a copy machine, if you make enough copies of a copy, you get this gray, fuzzy looking, illegible piece of paper. You don't want your DNA to be that. You want your DNA to be pristine. So think of vitamin E as kind of the whiteout that goes in and it makes sure that your copy, okay, is just as pristine, okay, as your original. So it basically cleans up the copy from any of those, again, proverbial fuzzy dots, et cetera, imperfections, if you will. That's what your vitamin E as an antioxidant helps to achieve for you. So that's why it's super important and you need it. And again, um, overconsumption of corn and soy oils, we know those to be big problems. So if you haven't already figured that part out, hopefully this isn't the first time you're hearing that message because that message is probably 20 years old. Um, but if it is the first time, welcome to the club, you know, cut out all the, all the processed oils. So that, that's any of you listening that go through the fast food line and what are you, you know, eating the French fries and all the other fried foods, what do you think they're frying them in? Most people fry in the soy oil, right? these highly polyunsaturated fatty acid oils, because again, remember the more unsaturated an oil, um, the, that, that makes it more liquid. At, and so when you, when you have a liquid oil, you can, it's good for frying. And that's one of the reasons why they use those oils for frying, aside from the fact that, that most people who are undereducated or uneducated believe that somehow that, that soy and corn are vegetables and therefore by default are somehow healthy for you when nothing could be further from the truth. Okay. So next, let's walk into vitamin E supplementation uh, and talk a little bit about, about some things. So these are diseases. I'm going to point this out. These are diseases on this side uh, of the page here, fatty liver disease, gallbladder dysfunction. And this includes any of you who've had a cholecystectomy or your gallbladder removed, okay? Non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So you can be gluten sensitive, but not have celiac disease, or even those with celiac disease, Crohn's, which is a large intestine inflammatory bowel disease pancreatitis, pancreatic insufficiency, cystic fibrosis, and steatorrhea. Let's, let's define what that means. That's fat in your poop. And that's just fat malabsorption, basically. So if you have any of these things, okay, then vitamin E supplementation may be necessary to prevent a deficiency, okay, or it may be necessary to correct a deficiency depending on how long you've had these and when you got a diagnosis. So if like if you were you know, if you were diagnosed, you know, after 10 years of struggling with your health and they finally figured out you had celiac disease, there's a much stronger likelihood that you have a vitamin E deficiency. And so supplementation might be necessary, not only to get you out of that deficiency, but it might be necessary moving forward. Okay. So these, so I want you to think about these conditions in two ways. Number one, you may need supplementation if you've got a recent diagnosis after years of struggle. Number two, you may need these vitamin or vitamin E if you have one of these conditions, because these conditions affect the way your body can absorb vitamin E. And so you may be at a disadvantage there with your body's capacity or ability to properly break down fat. And so that's what it boils down to, right? So with a fatty liver disease and gallbladder dysfunction, remember your liver produces bile, your gallbladder secretes bile, and that helps you digest and absorb fat. Now, what did I say earlier? Vitamin E is fat. It's a fat soluble vitamin. It is a fat in essence. It's a special type of fat. And we wanna make sure again, that if you have a problem with your liver producing bile, and some of you might have fatty liver disease or, or cirrhosis, right? Or a problem with your liver, your liver's breaking down fundamentally, and so it's not producing adequate bile. Bile is necessary. Bile acts like soap. If you've ever, you know, had really greasy hands and you took some soap and you washed them, why does that, how does that soap get the oil off your hands? That soap wraps around the fat, the grease that's on your hand, and it, and it basically, it coats it and turns it into a water-soluble agent. And this is what bile does. Bile wraps around fat. Okay, it emulsifies fat so that it's water soluble. And in this way, once that happens, once you have bile do that, it allows for that fat to be absorbed into the small intestines. And so again, if you're not making adequate bile, it's like not having enough soap to get the grease off of your hands. It just stays on your hands, right? And then it gets on everything that you touch. 
Well, in this regard, we need the bile to wrap around the vitamin E from the food that we eat so that it can be absorbed into our intestine. And so fatty liver, gallbladder dysfunction, or if you've had your gallbladder removed, look, if you've had your gallbladder removed, just, just on, a, on a side note here, um, let's change our color. Um, if you've had your gallbladder removed, vitamin A, D, E, K, and omega-3 fats. This is something you should have your doctor checking for. Oops, I'm sorry. I put an F there instead of a K. Let's change that. Vitamin E, D, E, and K, omega-3 fats. You should ask your doctor to test your levels six months on the just as part of your, your uh, biannual workup because if you don't have a functioning gallbladder, that means that you're not getting potentially getting the bile into your intestine adequately to be able to absorb these things. What we typically tend to see is people five to seven years away from a cholecystectomy or a gallbladder surgery start to develop deficiencies of fat soluble vitamins in a very big way. And you got to remember, um, we don't want to have a deficiency in vitamin E unless we want to age really fast. That's why it's on the top list of a lot of people's anti-aging supplements because again, it protects your DNA from free radical damage and, and, and mutations occurring. So again, non-celiac gluten sensitivity and celiac disease, we know that these conditions and Crohn's, right? Damage, these are inflammatory. So it's inflammation of your, in, of your GI tract, right? And when your GI tract is inflamed, how well do you think it's going to produce some of the enzymes that are required to break fat down? And so you've got different enzymes that are produced in your intestine that, that help you to break fat from your food down and help you to absorb fat better. So it's not just bile, but it's also chemicals. For example, lipase is one of those. Lipase is an enzyme that your pancreas produces um, that, that, and this is why pancreatitis and pancreatic insufficiency are on this list that helps you to digest and absorb fat. Okay, so we look at these three because they're inflammatory diseases of the GI tract and they, that inflammation can destroy some of, the, some of the ability of the GI tract to make digestive enzymes. So remember, you make digestive enzymes in your gut, but your pancreas here also produces digestive enzymes and secretes them into your gut, lipase being one of them in particular, responsible for helping you to absorb and digest and break down fats. Okay, so pancreatic insufficiency or pancreatitis and also cystic fibrosis is on that list. So again, this is, if you, if you or somebody you know has cystic fibrosis, this shouldn't be a mystery that cystic fibrosis, somebody you're prescribing doctor should have told you that vitamin E is a major issue in people with cystic fibrosis. And then I said earlier, steatorrhea, which is fat in your poop. And this fat in your poop really generally only occurs for one of two reasons, either number one, you're over consuming fat in such a big way that your body can't handle the quantity of fat you're eating. So you're just seeing fat come out in your poop. And this looks like, this makes your poop look clay colored or tan colored. So if you've got tan or clay colored stools, that's steatorrhea, that's fat in your stool. You're either eating too much fat or you're not absorbing the fat that you're eating and it's coming out because your body can't break it down. And so if you're seeing that, that's just kind of a hallmark for you to follow up with your doc and say, hey, look, I, I'm having fat in my stool. Is there a problem in my digestive tract somewhere? Is my liver breaking down? Is my gallbladder breaking down? Is my intestine breaking down? Do I have pancreatic insufficiency? Are any of these things going to lead to potentially a vitamin E deficiency, but not just vitamin E, the other fats as well? Again, vitamins A, D, E, and K. So very important to understand. These are, again, these are not conditions that you necessarily take vitamin E to fix. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is these conditions, if they pre-exist, make it easier for you to become deficient in vitamin E, and they may require vitamin E for you to supplementation for you to overcome and become healthy again. Okay. Let's talk about some other things on the medical side. So these are basically, these are medical interventions that you need to be aware of that can contribute to vitamin E deficiency. So I mentioned earlier, I mentioned if you've had your gallbladder removed, so gallbladder removal or a cholecystectomy, if you've had that done, it makes you more susceptible to vitamin E deficiency. If you've had a bowel resection, 
if you've had part of your bowel removed. Okay, and there's just, so some people with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis uh, have had bowel resection. Some people who have used um, aggressively, who have used drugs like NSAIDs, I've seen this happen before, NSAID induced bowel resection. So if you've used NSAID, and an NSAID is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Drugs like ibuprofen, um, these types of medicines damage and can, can damage your bowel. And I've seen cases where somebody was taking so much of it that they inflamed and damaged their bowel to such a great degree that it was so inflamed that they had to have a part of it removed, 18 inches, in fact. And so a bowel resection, remember when you pull out sections of your bowel, you reduce your ability to digest and absorb. So bowel resection, we could, we could, we could say this about really about any vitamin or mineral, but again, we're talking about vitamin E today. And then there's a, a couple of different classes of medicines. Predominantly the one that I've seen been, be used is cholestyramine, which is a cholesterol lowering agent. So it's, it's, it's kind of the, the first generation of cholesterol lowering drugs. Most people today, are put on statins, Lipitor, Zocor, that type of thing. These are not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about those. Cholestyramine is, is what's known as a bile acid sequestrant, okay? So basically what it does is as it sequesters bile, it in, by doing that, it inhibits your ability to adequately absorb fat-soluble nutrients. And so bile acid sequestrants like cholestyramine now, another reason why I bring this up is because many people with mold toxicity, one of the things that doctors are prescribing more recently to help clear out mold toxins is this drug right here, cholestyramine. And so if you've been diagnosed with mold toxicity and your doctor wants to put you on cholestyramine to basically to detoxify or help detoxify you from mold, you just need to be aware that that medicine, if you take it too long, it's going to hinder your vitamin E absorption, but not just E, it's going to inhibit A, D, and K and omega-3s as well. So just be aware of that if you're taking that cholestyramine or if you've been prescribed that. Now, if you're on it for lowering your cholesterol because you told your doctor you didn't want to be on a statin, you need to know this. Again, it can cause fat malabsorption problems. Other medicines, epilepsy. So if you're on phenobarbital, phenytoin, dilantin, um, carbamazepine, or Tegretol as its trade name, these are also known to interfere with vitamin E. So again, if you're an epileptic, you've been on seizure medicine, this is where, and this is, this is not, so epilepsy medicine doesn't just interfere with vitamin E, it also interferes with your B vitamins. And unfortunately, a deficiency in your B vitamins, okay, can increase your risk of seizure. I know it doesn't make sense for a doctor to give you a drug to treat your symptoms and then to induce a different uh, or in, in, to induce a nutritional issue that would actually increase your risk of seizure, but that's the nature of the beast. That's what happens. It happens every day. So just be aware of it so that you can have that conversation. But again, epilepsy medications for, for epilepsy or seizure disorders are notorious for affecting vitamin E. So just be aware of that. If you're, you know, if you're fitting any of the bills here, if you're fitting any of the diseases on the previous page, okay, again, those of you who have these issues and you're being medicated on this other side, you just need to be aware that vitamin E needs to be checked. You need to have it checked. And my advice is to have it checked about every six months. And so if it comes back low, you know you can supplement with it. It's a really easy and really inexpensive thing to do because go back to what I said at the very beginning, when we say the symptoms of vitamin E deficiency are. We said muscle pain, weakness, difficulty walking, nerve damage, and neuropathy is a very, very common situation nowadays. Cerebellar ataxia, visual disturbance, and anemias. None of these things are uncommon. These are all very, very common reasons why people will visit the doctor. And so if you fit the bill of any of those diseases and you have these symptoms in addition to, you know, what a lot of doctors do, unfortunately, is because they specialize, they put on their tunnel vision goggles. I, I shouldn't say they put on their tunnel vision goggles. I'll just say they're in a state of perpetual tunnel vision, meaning they're only really looking at you from one lens. 
And that's the lens of what are your existing symptoms and what can we call that? So like, let's say, for example, you're celiac. And part of the problem is that you developed over years with that celiac disease, you developed, there we go, you developed a vitamin E deficiency. And in that process, you started to develop neuropathy. And the doctor's saying, and again, I'm just giving you a hypothetical situation. The doctor's saying, okay, you have the neuropathy because you have celiac disease, and it's just a normal par for the course because we know gluten can cause neuropathy. Instead of saying, well, you have celiac disease and it's possible for 10, 15 years, you've actually developed this muscle pain, not because of a neuropathy from celiac disease per se, but because of the consequences, which vitamin E deficiency could be one of those consequences. But if they're not measuring your nutrition, if they're not measuring your vitamins, your minerals on a regular basis, they'll never know that. And so then they'll just say, oh, you have neuropathy, let's send you to the neurologist. Then the neurologist will say, oh yeah, it's real common for people with celiac disease to have neuropathy. Let's put you on gabapentin or Lyrica and that's the end of it, right? And so now you're just being put on a chemical to reduce a symptom that if we just knew about your nutrition, you wouldn't have to go on the chemical. So it's important that you understand nutrients, vitamins and minerals. I harp on this over and over and over again because they're essential, meaning your body can't function normally without them. And if you don't have them measured periodically, you don't even know whether or not the symptoms that you're experiencing are as a result of those nutritional deficiencies. Because I can promise you this, there are very few board certified experts in clinical nutrition in the world. I'm one of them. There are others, certainly. But the average doctor that graduates from medical school or chiropractic school or osteopathic school or naturopathic school, they, they don't necessarily, naturopaths more than any of those probably mentioned, um, they don't necessarily get a super hyper-focused nutritional training in their background. Medical doctors get less than seven hours of nutritional training. I know I've said that before, but again, if you're new to the show and this is the first time you're hearing that, listen to what I'm saying. Nutrition is the most important thing you can measure and your doctor doesn't have more than seven hours of training in it unless they went on to get postgraduate training. And that's very, very rare in today's world. Okay, last thing I wanna talk about here with vitamin E our gluten sensitivity and the vitamin E deficiency symptoms overlap. So again, I was talking about this a minute ago. There are some things that we know gluten can cause. Okay, for example, we know that gluten can cause cerebellar ataxia. We know that, that, that gluten can cause muscle pain and weakness. We know that it can cause neuropathy. We know that it can cause anemia. Okay, now, so then the question becomes, if gluten can cause all these things, okay, gluten directly. So this is, when I say gluten can cause it, here's what I mean. Gluten-induced inflammation to the area. So gluten-induced inflammation to the muscle, to the brain, to the nerves, to the blood cells, okay? That's one way we know gluten can cause it. Now, we also know that gluten can cause inflammation to the GI tract. And as I said earlier, that inflammation to the GI tract can lead to reduction and absorption. I'm gonna abbreviate that, absorption of nutrients, i.e. vitamin E deficiency, other vitamins, other minerals as well. So gluten can induce inflammation directly to the organs but gluten can also, as it damages the GI tract, can also damage your body's ability to absorb the vitamin E. So the vitamin E deficiency might be as a result of gluten-induced damage to the GI tract. The vitamin E deficiency might also just be poor diet. And you have gluten issue. So you've got gluten-induced inflammation in the GI tract, but you also have low vitamin E in your diet. And so again, vitamin E deficiency chemically can cause all these things and because it can, and you may, again, like I said earlier, you might have a history of gluten sensitivity or celiac disease. This is why it's so critical because of this overlap, okay? You don't wanna just have somebody tell you, oh, it's just the celiac disease creating the problem. We'll send you to pain management. Because it happens every day, it happens all the time. People get sent to neurologists or pain management uh, or rehab and they get, drugs or they get rehabilitation or whatever it might be, but those things don't correct this. 
they don't correct a, a potential for a deficiency. And so again, that's what you really want to have looked at. You want to have that analysis done so that you know, is this a true vitamin E deficiency? Does it need to be corrected? Do we need supplementation? Do we need a, a specific amount or quantity of supplementation to overcome that deficiency and the symptoms that it's creating? Otherwise, what ends up happening is you just blame the disease that you have, and then you just add another drug to the mix, and that's not a solid answer. Okay, last point here. I mentioned earlier the best source of vitamin E is a mixed tocopherols, not just alpha tocopherol, but mixed tocopherols with alpha, gamma, uh, delta, and beta versions of tocopherols. So you want them all. You don't want just want alpha tocopherol. But if we're looking at, at kind of quantities, most supplemental preparations are anywhere from 200 to 400 IU or units. Um, and so if we're talking about just kind of a day-to-day -day quantity, if you're supplementing, this is probably sufficient to prevent a massive deficiency. But if we're talking about a massive deficiency already existing, you know, you need a 800 plus, just depending on the situation or circum, excuse me, circumstances. So again, this is probably enough for day to day, but this might be an amount that you want to take if you're trying to overcome a really big deficiency. Now, where you have to be careful with vitamin E, there are a couple of other things that to consider. Vitamin E can thin your blood. One of the things that it does at higher doses is it can actually interfere with vitamin K's ability to keep your blood clotted. So we know that vitamin E, it's one of those natural ways to thin the blood. And a lot of doctors will give blood thinners, but we're not even realizing that naturally vitamin E can help thin the blood. But vitamin E can thin the blood. So takeaway here is if you're on a blood thinner, something like an Eliquis or a Warfarin or Coumadin, you've gotta be real careful because if you get high levels of vitamin E and you don't tell your prescribing doctor that you're on kind of that combination, you could make your blood too thin. All right, so think about it. if you're walking and you're hitting a wall and you're just bruising and, you're, and your skin's breaking out in pools of bruise um, and you're on a lot of vitamin E, that's something to consider. There are other things that can thin your blood too, but it's when you start combining a lot of different things. So this is just kind of a precaution. If you're gonna use this amount, know that it can thin your blood uh, and just be aware of that interaction so that you don't end up over thinning your blood and potentially having another type of problem altogether. Okay, let's open it up for questions. Let's see what we got today. Um, So this is kind of an off-topic question. Juan's asking, what healthy product can replace my Lanta for soothing, you know, like a heartburn or a GERD? One of the ones I recommend, Juan, if you, you can check it out at Gluten-Free Society, is a, is a, it's a multi-blend called GI Soothe. And uh, you might check that one out. That, that can, you know, it has a number of different ingredients that are what are known as mucilaginous uh, ingredients and they can kind of put a coat and soothe the GI tract. So if you're trying to get something instead of Mylanta, that might be an option for you. Uh, Lori says, I've heard that alpha tocopherol can cause cancer. Is that true? No, it's not true. There's no great research that shows that alpha tocopherol or any other vitamin E isomer can contribute to cancer. Now, you should all be aware of something else, though. Um, if you've been with me for any length of time, you know that we've been subjected to the mainstream media's, um, we'll just say outright lies and misinformation. If you guys remember, it was just a few months ago that um, the New York Post wrote a piece on me saying I was recommending lethal doses of vitamins. And it was really quite a laughable article, and we had to we had to threaten to, uh, to sue them in order to get them to make the changes. But Regardless of that, there is a, there, we'll just call it an assault on nutrition. And one of those assaults is to produce studies designed to mislead the general public. 
I'm going to give you an example because I almost myself got rung, rung into one of these. Um, it was years ago. Um, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Texas. So there's a University of Texas in Galveston, which is a training facility for, for intern doctors. Um, they came to me and wanted to meet with me because they wanted to use my CoQ10 formulation in one of their studies. And so we had a meeting and they presented the study. They were doing the study. Again, they were trying to, to use me for my CoQ10 basically, but they presented me with the study and how they were going to lay out the parameter. And I read the study parameters and I asked, I looked up and asked them, I said, why did you design this study to fail? This is going to be a really misleading trial and it's not going to really serve anybody who could, who could benefit because they're going to learn that they think CoQ10 is ineffective. And the reason why is that they designed the study to mislead the public. They designed it on purpose to fail. The do in this particular instance, for me, they designed the study with such a low dose of CoQ10 that we knew it wouldn't have an outcome because prior studies had already been done saying that for congestive heart failure patients, if you're going to try to use CoQ10 to improve their outcomes, and their ejection fracture, then you've got to have a certain level of CoQ10. Well, they were giving like a tenth of that level necessary. And so when I, when I challenged them, I challenged the doctors on why they designed the study to fail, their faces turned beet red and they just tried to backpedal. I'm like, look, I'm not going to have or donate any of my products to a study that's designed to mislead the public that something natural might not work very effectively. This happens all the time in the industry. You have to understand what you're up against. You're up against big propaganda and big information. And so like when you read a study, which when you read kind of some of these on the internet articles about vitamin E and the potential for cancer, these studies are very poorly done. They're very misleading. And there's no evidence that vitamin E or alpha tocopherol will actually contribute to or lead to the formation of cancer. There is, on the other hand, tons of research showing that the anti-cancer effects of alpha tocopherol. Remember, it's one of the most powerful fat protecting antioxidants. There are a number of studies that show cancer cell lines can't survive vitamin E. Um, so, so we know that, that again, that vitamin E has potential for being an anti-cancer agent. But again, what a lot of these studies are designed to do is mislead you. And oftentimes they mislead you to, to making you think that the supplement actually causes the very same disease that it might be beneficial for. So just be careful of what you read, because a lot of times these studies are designed to fail. So Tamara's asking about air hunger related to a vitamin E deficiency. So yeah, shortness of breath, air hunger, where you're trying to get air and you just feel like you can't get enough. Any anemia can cause that, including a, a vitamin E deficiency, hemolytic anemia. So yes, we are referring to that. Okay, let's see. I like that. Liz commented, the caps at the end of your shoelaces are called aglets. I didn't know that. Thanks for teaching me today, Liz. Do I recommend gamma vitamin E for those that are okay for total vitamin E, but low in gamma vitamin E? Seems like gamma is often low. I, I recommend a full spectrum, Bonnie. Um, and the reason why is if you had your vitamin E checked, your gamma and your alpha tocopherol, it's most likely checked in your serum. And that's a, not a super accurate way to get a reading on your vitamin E levels. So um, I, would, I would actually recommend a mixed tocopherol formulation. I can put one up, uh, one, of the, one of the better quality, definitely a gluten-free version into the, I'll put that up in the feed for you guys. It's, ca it's called Ultra E, but it's a mixture of, of, of the tocopherols. Is there a vitamin E supplement available that does not contain sunflower or soy as the source? Yeah, I've come across a number of them. You have to, you'd have to look at um, sunflowers, a very common source. Um, and, and I would say I wouldn't worry so much about sunflower. It's the soy that I really get concerned with, mostly not because it's from soy, but because soy oftentimes is grown genetically modified. So you have the potential for pesticide residue being in the product, but you have to understand when they're taking it from the oil, they're extracting it. And if, as long as it's a cold extraction process that preserves the integrity of the vitamin E and that they're preserving it in it, usually it needs to be preserved in a gel cap because that gel protects it from the air and the light. 
Now, then, then even if it's a soy-based product, unless you're allergic to soy, it still should be okay, provided it's produced from an organic soy. That's, that's where it's going to be, in my opinion, more important. Uh, Tiffany asking, would a symptom of vitamin E deficiency be thin skin? Uh, so not so much thin skin, but bleeding very easily is definitely, um, uh, you might, you know, if, you, if that's what's happening to your father, I would think more protein. As we get older, protein malnourishment, protein deficiency, stomach acid loss tends to lead to, to problems with the skin and the collagen that help form the robustness of skin more than, than I would think vitamin E deficiency as being a culprit in that. Uh, let's see here. What do you need if your spleen has been removed? That's kind of a unique question. That's probably a bigger topic than what we got time to cover in the rest of our Q and A tonight. Um, so Todd says, um, making a recommendation about liposomal vitamin C. I'd be real cautious about liposomal vitamin C. Most of those are corn derivative. And if you're trying to follow the no grain, no, plain, no pain plan, you, you might run into a problem with that. Um, I heard vitamin E acetate in high doses can be harmful to the immune system. Is it so? No, not necessarily. Um, and you have to define high doses because again, what I'm giving you here, what I gave you here a minute ago, you know, up to 800 units is pretty, you know, it's pretty safe. Uh, it's pretty safe range where you don't have to worry about any kind of damage. Now there's a law, Marie, in that anything given in high enough doses can actually become toxic. And that includes nutrients, but, you know, define what you mean by high doses and we could maybe get you a better answer. So Carlene wants to know, can I recommend a topical vitamin E? I would, so if I'm recommending a topical, I actually recommend that you take the gel cap and you break it open or you put a pin in it and then you squeeze the vitamin E out of it onto the skin directly. And the reason why I say that is because when you buy those lotions, the vitamin E inside those lotions is already being exposed to air and light and other things. And so that, again, that's that gel cap that protects it from photo oxidation and, and, uh, and oxidation from air. And so you, you want to have it protected if you're going to use it as an, in, on the skin as an antioxidant. So break out, open the capsule itself and apply it directly to the skin. How much vitamin E is optimal taken as this? I think I answered that one already. Let's see. Would the eye damage include the eyes going to the right and freezing there for 15 to 20 seconds? No, that's, if you've got eye damage like that, that sounds more like um, you got a potential problem with the relay of the nerve that feeds the muscles of your eyes. And so, I mean, it, it, technically, it, I guess it could be an eropathy, but I, I've seen that type of problem Rosie, more associated with B vitamin deficiencies. So I, I would, you know, just with my experience, I would tend to suspect B vitamin deficit over a vitamin E creating that type of problem. So Virginia says, there's a specific lab to check for vitamin e deficiency. Ask your doctor to check intracellularly. So it's called intracellular analysis is the way that you want to have that investigated. So serum levels can change from day to day. If your last meal was high in vitamin E, but your last five months of meals wasn't, you can get a false normal on a, on a serum blood test. And that's where they can, they can be tricky. So intracellular is a, is a much, much better effective way at measuring it. Let's see here. What about gabapentin? I had seizure-like episodes after coming off it a few months ago. Um, so Kristen, I'm not sure what your question is. Could gabapentin create a seizure-like episode coming off of it? Yeah, when you're coming off of a drug that manipulates your biochemistry, the way your nerves communicate, that, that, that's a possibility. Talk to your prescribing doc. 
Um, but gabapentin is not something that we know of, at least at this point, that causes a vitamin E deficiency. Uh, Marie asks, can vitamin E help anxiety? It, it, there are some studies that show that it can. There's actually some research that shows that vitamin E can be an, uh, a horm for, we, for females, a hormone modulator, so uh, particularly with estrogen and progesterone. So there's, there's evidence that, that states that there's a possibility that it might be helpful or beneficial. Uh, but I can just simply say, in my experience, it's more common, just like with the, with the eye issue earlier, it's more common for uh, B vitamins to play a role in anxiety, B vitamin deficiency, rather. Uh, Becky's asking if natural blood thinner like vitamin E is good for antiphospholipid syndrome. Uh, you know, I would ask your doctor, again, get with your doc on that, kind of those specific types of questions like that. I can't you know, it's hard because I don't know who you are. I don't know your history. It's hard for me to really just say, yeah, everybody with any phospholipid syndrome needs to take vitamin E because I don't think we have any research that would really support that. But again, if you ask your doctor about checking you, and I would ask your doctor while you're at it, if we're talking about blood thickening because of antiphospholipid syndrome being an inflammatory issue, have a measure, you know, your full spectrum of vitamins and minerals because magnesium is a natural blood thinner too, and you might be low in that. And so there might be a couple of really good natural hits for you that you're deficient in that might help you um, with that, with that, uh, with the symptoms of that condition. How, okay, so Virginia said, Doc, um, because you brought up the supplement, how much CoQ10 should you take if you've had surgery? Is 100 milligrams a day enough? No, um, not if you're talking post-surgical recovery. You really want to err around three to 500 milligrams a day you know, for probably at least a good six weeks after the fact, if that's, if, you know, if you're trying to recover and you're trying to support your body's ability to recover using a meaningful quantity, um, definitely want to hit that three to 500 milligram a day mark. Um, hundreds not just not going to be enough to cut it. Don can, Don's asking, can you take vitamin E for neuropathy symptoms? You can, you can, you know, whether or not it will correct them is, you know, that's where the, you know, the proverbial tire hits the pavement. You know, if vitamin E deficiency is causing neuropathy symptoms and taking vitamin E for it would be a, an excellent idea. This is, goes back to where I would recommend that, you know, that you folks get tested, get with your docs and ask them to test you. Okay, let's see. Um, can vitamin E um, support endometriosis? Um, if the vitamin, yeah, it can, but again, it goes back to whether or not it's like, again, if we take a thousand women with endometriosis and we give them all vitamin E at, at kind of therapeutic doses, we're not going to see that they all respond favorably. Not, not that we're going to see them respond um, negatively, but, but the question is, can vitamin E help with it? For some, it can. And that just depends really, at least in my experience, on whether or not they have a deficiency in the first place. So again, a lot of people are prone to taking supplements because they read something somewhere and, uh, and, it, and it, it sounds like it would be a good idea for them to do it. And it's certainly safe to do. You can take nutrition, vitamins, minerals, including vitamin E, at, because you know, there's not really much of a toxicity profile unless you're just taking the whole bottle on a regular basis or taking half a bottle on a regular basis, but whether or not it's going to help you, again, that's it's where the, the tire hits the pavement. That's a, the proverbial proof is in the pudding, as they say. Let's see. Um, Rachel saying CoQ10, I'm told, cannot be used by cancer patients. I don't know who told you that, but it was somebody who didn't know much about biochemistry of CoQ10 and cancer. And if it was an oncologist, they probably told you that because oncologists are gonna tell you to never take any antioxidants while you're getting chemo or radiation. They're, they're, they're notorious for saying that any antioxidant's gonna interfere with the chemo. And there's no real, real research that supports them saying that. That's really, um, in my opinion, it's, it's, I'll just say it's irresponsible to say that without having the data to back it up, especially in somebody with cancer who we know um, has probably a very real issue with their antioxidants. And it's probably one of the reasons why they, why they went on to develop the cancer was because they didn't have adequate antioxidant protection. So 
to tell you not to take an antioxidant over the fact that they're going to poison you and they don't want the, the healthy thing to interfere with the thing that's, that's not healthy. I, again, it just never made sense to me. Uh, any other vitamins that should compete with vitamin E absorption? Um, mainly vitamin K. Vitamin E and vitamin K have a, a kind of a, an effect with each other. Now, that doesn't mean if you take vitamin E that you have to take vitamin K. Generally, if you're pretty well nourished and you have a vitamin E or vitamin K deficiency, you can take extra of whatever you're deficient in and not necessarily create a major imbalance. Where people get in trouble is they mega dose things for long periods of time. Again, that's where you have to worry about some of those nutrient nutrient interactions. Uh, so follow up to Virginia's question about CoQ10. Um, the doctor did his heart surgery, told him to take 100 milligrams. That was a number of years ago. Is it too late, is it too late to up it? Um, no, it's never too late to up it, but it may not be helpful at this point. If we're talking about a surgery that was done years ago, and we're talking about getting in extra CoQ10 to support the recovery process and the trauma that was induced as a result of that surgery. Now, he might benefit from CoQ10 for other reasons. You might, in essence, if he had a heart surgery, it's probably maybe because he had a heart issue, and maybe that heart issue is related to CoQ10 deficiency. You know, CoQ10 deficiency can cause congestive heart failure. It can cause high blood pressure, and it's also an antioxidant that protects and preserves the vascular tree. So it might have other additional benefits for him beyond that 100 milligrams. But in my experience, people with cardiovascular disease, I, I, no less than 200 milligrams is going to be super therapeutically effective. And it also depends on the type that he's taking because you really want to make sure it's a, a pure free form ubiquinol um, and, and not, not your, just your traditional powdered CoQ10. Are there, PJ wants to know, are there general guidelines about how long to take specific individual supplements versus taking multivitamins? Not really. There's nothing, there, I mean, you can read all kinds of generalized information online, uh, but again, generalized information is usually a, a conglomeration of different people's opinions and whether or not their opinions are valid is that's the issue that remains to be seen. I always like to look at it as it's biochemically individual. Each person supplementing is unique to them and, and we shouldn't try to generalize for everybody. Uh, and I think that's where guidelines really have gotten a lot of our, our country in trouble nutritionally. You look at the food guide pyramid as a general broad spectrum nutritional recommendation and it includes sugar and hydrogenated fat on it. And that to me is a travesty. Is vitamin E recommended to be avoided for cancer therapy with tamoxifen? Actually, there, I've seen some research with vitamin E with tamoxifen being more effective. So I, 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 again, I think it would be a conversation worth having with your cancer doctor. Um, but I've seen research that actually shows vitamin E being helpful with tamoxifen. Okay. Looks like we are on... Uh, we're, we're at the time limit here. So uh, questions are, they, they're not, they're not stopping. So guys, if you've got additional questions, you want to see me cover additional topics, look, send me a message, shoot a, shoot an email over to glutenology at gmail.com. And also if you're new to the show, make sure you come visit me and sign up for our newsletter over at glutenfreesociety.org. Look, we've got the largest gluten-free newsletter in the world. And uh, sign up for it. I'll send you a bunch of free, wonderful information on how you can navigate no grain, no pain, the gluten-free diet, as well as, you know, information about nutrition and how nutrition can support you in your endeavors. Look, I want you to do me a favor now. I did you a favor. I have these shows for you every Monday night. Do me a favor and help me get this information out to more people. You guys know we're being uh, shadow banned, right? We're, we're actually being, we, we've, been, um, uh, we've been censored. We've been quieted. So the more people that you can share this information with, the more people we can help together. So remember, share with friends and family who might need this information and help save a life today. Remember, our goal is to save 100 million lives. So help me on that endeavor. I'll help you and you help me and we'll all win together. So I wish you an excellent week and a healthy week. We'll see you next Monday night for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Take care.
Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is going to allow us to remind you right before we go live. But it's also going to allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long, and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much, and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.